invite you to hear the reading of the scripture for this morning. It comes to us from Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 17. Jesus replied to Simon Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Several, several years ago, now, I was with my group, who were part of the Methodist Educational Leave Society, and, and we were traveling, studying in different locations throughout the country and the world, and, and we wound up, of all places, we were on the campus of UC Berkeley. Now that was a pretty rude awakening for me, just to be honest with you. And it was Sunday morning, and we were going to do what we did every Sunday morning. We preachers would get up, and we'd put our suit and tie on, and we'd go to church. Now remember where we are. And, and we were trying to decide where we were going to go to church at that day. And we found a church in the Yellow Pages. That's not always the best place to find a church. But this was probably before uh, the internet. So we did the best we could. And we found a little church just on the edge of the campus in Berkeley. And, and it had the name Trinity. And, and how in the world can you go wrong with a church named Trinity? You can't miss that. So we put our suits and our ties on. And five, let's just say middle-aged men wearing suits and ties, walking five blocks across the UC Berkeley campus. We were a sight. Uh, and we, we had a lot of hoo-hoos as we went by. But when we arrived at that little church, we, we found it was a little church. It was a three-story high church. Had a big, tall steeple on it. But yet, the windows were knocked out. It was vacated. There was a lock on the door. Paint was coming off of the outside. And, and hidden in the shrubbery, overgrown, was a for sale sign. We thought we really messed up. And we turned to start to walk away, and these three gentlemen parked right in front of the little chapel. They got out of their car, and they had on $1,000 suits. And they walked up to us and said, Hey, you guys going to buy that church? <laughs> uh, and we just found out it was for sale. But what we found out later is these gentlemen walked across the street to a very affluent church. That that big old building was for sale. And they were now worshiping in what used to be the chapel. So we went into the chapel for worship. And, and trust me, uh, we were very obvious that we were not from there. Uh, it, and they, they made a big commotion over us, but, but what we learned was that little church was for sale. They actually fed hundreds of people every week. We found out that that little church that was for sale had a free medical plan. We found out they had a reading program for those who were trying to read. We found out that that little church offered discipleship opportunities in a very difficult place on that campus. But what we really found out was this, that if that church was for sale, we couldn't afford it. See, buildings can be bought and buildings can be sold. But the church, the church will survive and flourish forever. Amen. Jesus was in the region of Dan. 
And he was teaching his disciples that day. And as he taught his disciples that day, Peter made that great confession that you are the Son of God. You are the Christ. And then follows the text for today. As Jesus was preparing to give off leadership to those twelve. As Jesus was a, about to leave, he wanted his disciples to know something about the church. And Jesus said, Peter, upon that kind of great confession you just made, that's going to be the rock. And upon that testimony, I'm going to build my church. And not even the very assault of the gates of hell will stand against it. Buildings can be bought and buildings can be sold. But the true church of the Lord Jesus will thrive in this world forever and ever. So I've been trying to figure out the last two sermons I'm going to preach here. It's almost like if I could tell you something I really want to tell you, this is what it would be. <laughs> well, this is number two. Uh, when we study the Older Testament, we see the picture of Israel goes like this. You know what I'm talking about. There are moments of great blessing, and then there are times that descend into the darkness. The easiest thing in the world is to live under the blessing of heaven. But the question that Israel had to deal with, uh, the question that the, the church, the institutional church, has had to deal with, is, is how do you maintain the blessing of God on your life? How do you do that? Certainly it's easier to arrive at the blessing than it is to stay there. You, you hear football coaches trying to develop a dynasty. And they will tell you that that, that first national championship is easier than the second, and the third, <coughs> and the fourth. Because it's very difficult to maintain that level. And even for all of us, it's difficult to maintain the blessing of God. And, and this morning, for just a, a few short minutes, I want to talk to you about maintaining the blessing of God. And, and I want to talk to you about what makes a great church. In Berkeley that day, I, I learned some valuable lessons. But the most valuable lesson I learned that day is how expendable preachers really are. And the second lesson I learned is another one of those outs is how expendable lay folks are. I even looked up what it, expendable meant because I didn't want to make a fool out of myself. It, it expendable means something in light of the grand scheme of things that makes one less important. And in the grand scheme of things, in this church, there are certain things that makes persons expendable. Not, not unimportant, really, but expendable. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about what makes a great church. And I'm going to go on record first and foremost and just tell you that Gunnersville First United Methodist Church is a great church. This is a great church. And that's just not, that's not my opinion. It's places where I go. And, and, and folks who have heard about this church over the last 30 years will say, that's a great church. That's a great church. And, and today we can, we can talk about all the great things this church does. And it's a tremendous church because we have a great mission outreach. We, we're a church that has influenced our community. We're, we're a church that has a dynamic children's ministry. A powerful youth ministry. 
We're a church that now reaches out to a group of people easily forgotten. And that's those who are uh, somewhat memory challenged. Uh, we, we're a great church because we, we have thrived uh, with, with uh, our giving. It's a great church because we have influenced many people in discipleship. There are just so many great things that you could say, we're a great church. But I want to share with you that not any one of those is what makes a church great. They are just benefits of a great church. They're just markers of a church that's great. Quickly, four things. That makes a great church. If you're going to be a great church, you have to have a great vision. And, and you heard that read this morning by Devin. Where there is no vision, people perish. Or people cast off restraint and do their own thing. You would think that every group of people who meet in a building on Sunday morning, would have a common vision of how great our God is. You would think that. But so many people that I see now, and, and I'm trying to live into my next job before I get there, and I hear so many people say, well, preacher, we just want to make it for another year. Preacher, we just, we just trying to pay the bills. We're just trying to survive. We, we don't want to die. And over the years, I've heard so many people stand up at charge conferences when the DS would say, well, what great things happened this year in your church? And it would go something like this. Well, we paid all the bills and we got a few dollars left. You would think that every church would have a great vision of our great God because we serve a great, great God. And once you capture the vision of the great God we serve, there will be blessing. And there will be greatness. But the second thing, if you're going to be a great church, you need to have a great commandment. And we have that. Jesus said in Matthew again, he said, to, in, in a response, I guess you will, from the rank and file of the religious folks, they said, Master, which one of the 613 commandments are the greatest? They thought they had him. And Jesus said, well, let's try it like this. The first great commandment is that you love God with all your heart, so, it's great. And the second is like the first. Except you love your neighbor as you do yourself. Can you imagine what our church would be like if we took that seriously? To love God above everything else in this world. To love God above any and all other challenges and commitments in our life. In the second part of that, can you imagine how great the church would be if we loved others as much as we loved ourselves? If you're going to be a great church, you have to have a great vision and you have to have a great commandment. The third thing is if you're going to be a Great church, you have to have a great commission. In chapter 28 of Matthew, he said this, right as he was about to hand the keys off to those 12, excuse me, now 11 disciples. He was about to hand the keys off. He was about to give the, the, the owner's manual to them. And he said this, he said, I want you to go. I want you to go. And I, I want you to go into all the world to preach, to baptize, and teach. 
Jesus said a great church is a going church, not a saved church. Amen. A great church is one who has a great commission and follows that great commission. Wherever they is, there is just one lost person, the church will go. Where there's an unreached people, like in the hill country of Ecuador this morning where our mission team is headed, the church will go. And we will teach and preach and baptize in the strong name of Jesus. Great church is a going, preaching, teaching, baptizing church. Finally, if you're going to be a great church, if you're going to be a great church, you've got to have a great Savior. In Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, listen to what Paul says about our great Savior. Therefore God exalted Him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave Him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledges that Jesus is Lord. Amen. To the glory of God the Father. And he just couldn't quit. In chapter 3 he comes back and he says this, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things I consider them garbage that I may again gain Christ. <clears throat> we have a great Savior. We, we have a product that sells itself. We are put into a world that's desperate. Into a world that is lost as a ball in high weeds. We're in the midst of a culture that's run amok that needs a rock to build upon. And we have been given a great Savior. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. And, and yes, we have, we have great resources in this church. We have, we have great leadership in this church. We, we have a faithful group of disciples here. But that's not what's going to make this church great. The thing that makes this church great is we have a great Savior. And we can never, ever get that. We have a Savior that came preaching both grace and truth. And we're challenged to carry Him into all the world. Even if this church was for sale, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford it. But the good news is, first, it's not for sale. Because the church of the Lord Jesus is never for sale. It's greater than our personalities. It's, it's greater than our own personal wishes and wants. It's greater than issues. His church stands above and beyond. And, and it's not for sale. But it's also very inviting. And His church invites any and all to come and experience spiritual transformation and the challenge to build upon the solid rock. What a privilege 
It's been for me to be a part of a church that believes that for the last 10 years. And that's just the beginning. I inherited that from another pastor. And he inherited it from another pastor. You can, you can trace the roots. And that's the church that meets on this corner every Sunday. And whatever happens, there will be a powerful, great church here. God be the glory.